In our last video, we demonstrated a commercial turbojet engine on our custom built test stand. And then we ran an interesting experiment to see if we could enhance the output of the engine by using a device called an augmenter. Now, these devices are reputedly able to substantially increase the thrust of pulsed engines like these. But the few papers that I read indicated that they do not work with continuous output engines like this. But I didn't believe them. So we decided to test that. And as it turned out, they were right. I was wrong. It didn't work. So we dove a little bit deeper into this. And I actually contacted a researcher in this field. And they gave us a little bit deeper insight into how these things operate and why they need to operate in a pulsed mode rather than a continuous mode. So today, we're going to move on and we're going to get into the pulsed engines. In order to do this test, though, we had to make some modifications to our test stand. Because these engines are substantially longer, we needed to increase the length of our sliding rail that supports the engines to give them enough clearance. And in addition, because of the extra cantilever, I added an extra set of bearings here to spread the load, give it a bigger wheelbase. In addition, because these engines produced pulses of output, I added a spring damping system to the front of the sliding rail to help it to absorb these peak pulses so that we don't get the high intensity, high amplitude pulses slamming into the load cell. We lower the amplitude and we broaden the duration of the pulses, making it easier for us to detect what the average thrust output of these different engines are. So now let's get into the engine. Pulse jets have been around for a very long time, over 100 years. They were used to attack London during World War II. And they're built by many amateurs to power RC aircraft and hobby projects. They're even used by some militaries around the world to power target drones. The reason for this is that the structure is relatively simple and the manufacturing tolerances are quite loose compared to, say, the turbojet engine. The result is that they're cheap. And if you're going to be shooting something down anyway, it's kind of nice that it doesn't cost a lot. Now, the way these things operate is actually kind of fascinating. Before you start them up, the combustion chamber contains air, just like me. When you turn on the fuel pump and you begin to pump fuel into the engine, you create a flammable mixture inside the combustion chamber. In this case, today we're using gasoline, but you can use propane and you can use diesel. Once you have established a combustible mixture in here, you have a spark that can initiate a burn, a flame. And when it does so, the flame begins to spread from that initiation point in an expanding spherical shell, like an expanding bubble, with the reaction zone of the gasoline in the air representing the surface of that bubble. And as it's expanding through the, the chamber, it's doing so at a relatively low velocity, a few tens of meters per second. It's the same kind of burn that occurs in a car engine, in a normal jet engine, even a rocket engine. And it's called a deflagration, D-E-F, as in Foxtrot. The bottom line is it's a subsonic expansion of the burn front. Meanwhile, what's happening is all of the heat and the pressure that's being released by that reaction is being distributed through all the material inside of the combustion chamber, including the reactants, the gasoline in the air that haven't burned yet. And that spread of that effect is at nearly the speed of sound. The speed of sound at room temperature and at sea level is approximately 330 meters per second. It's defined as the mean velocity of the particles, the air molecules, as they're bouncing off of each other and recoiling from all the surfaces in the room. If you increase the heat of the air, you add energy, 
Heat energy is kinetic energy. In other words, you're increasing the velocity of the particles and therefore you increase the speed of sound. The bottom line is though, all of that pressure that's occurring inside of the engine continues to build as the fuel is being consumed until eventually the flame front hits the walls and you've run out of gasoline and air. At that point, you've reached the highest pressures and the highest temperatures inside the combustion chamber. While that pressure is increasing, an interesting thing happens at the front of the engine. This assembly right here is a specialized one-way valve that's comprised of a stack of individual spring steel strips that are mounted in such a way that they form a triangle with the apex of the triangle aiming inside toward the ch uh, combustion chamber. When the pressure increases inside that combustion chamber, it forces the strips together, closing off the front of the engine. So the only way that the high pressure, high temperature gases can exhaust is out the back of the engine at a very high velocity. That is the momentum, the acceleration of that gas that produces the thrust in the other direction. Now, once that gas begins to exhaust from here, the pressures begin to drop and they continue to drop. And the point is, because of the inertia of that gas moving out of the back, when the pressure of the gases inside the combustion chamber reach ambient pressure, the outside pressure around the engine, they don't stop dropping. The inertia is enough to continue sending the gases downstream. Once the pressure drops below atmospheric pressure, the valves in the front see a larger force against the outside of the valve, and it forces those spring steel strips apart and a fresh charge of air is pushed into the ch chamber to mix with the fuel that's been continuously spraying inside of the chamber. Meanwhile, the pulse that's exhausting out of the end is slowing. There's less pressure to drive it and it continues to slow. And eventually the trailing edge of that pulse slows so much that it stops moving backwards, peels away from the main pulse and rockets back into the chamber, and it's red hot. When it slams into the fresh charge, it ignites it and starts the process all over again. So the engine becomes self-sustaining. You only need the spark plug to get the thing started, and then it runs forever. Now, the frequency at which this happens is highly dependent on the dimensions of the engine because the reaction process that I described is pretty much consistent from engine to engine. So if you have a very tiny engine, you have more of these pulses per second and it buzzes or it hums almost like a violin. If you have a very large engine, then what happens is you get much more powerful pulses, but it happens at a much, much lower frequency like a cello. Now you can affect that, that frequency a little bit with the throttle by setting it up and down because you increase the vigorousness or the, the reactions inside of the engine. You make them more robust, you make them more powerful, they happen a little more quickly, but it's a very small effect. Now, when we get this engine running, one of the sort of main challenges in getting these things to operate is the starting procedure. And to make it as effective as possible, one of the things that you want to do is you want to have a source of air blowing into the engine during the start process. Sometimes when you ignite the fuel, you don't get a consistent burn. It doesn't begin to resonate. And you don't want the fuel, which is continually being sprayed in, to flood the engine and create a large combustible pool at the bottom of the engine. So by blasting air in there and having a fresh charge of air, you have a much higher uh, likelihood of getting a successful start right from the beginning. Now, you can do that with a leaf blower, you can do it with a bottle of compressed air and a little squirt valve, but we permanently mounted this fan on the front because we want to do two things. One, we want to get the engine started, but this particular fan is remarkably powerful. It can consume up to four kilowatts and has an exhaust velocity that I measured at 185 miles per hour. I'm not sure exactly how to convert that into kilometers per hour, but it's probably somewhere around you know, 300 or 320 kilometers per hour. That's fast. These engines are very fuel inefficient. The reason is they have a very low compression ratio. Inside of this engine, their peak pressures top out at about 
one additional atmosphere, a doubling of atmospheric pressure, or two atmospheres absolute. So when the engine begins moving forward through the air on a vehicle, ram pressure into the inside of the engine actually can substantially increase the efficiency of the burn, the compression ratio, the fuel efficiency, as well as the thrust. So once we establish what our baseline thrust is, we're then going to run it as if it were flying through the air at 185 miles an hour and see if we get any enhancement in the performance. So that's the setup. Let's go outside and annoy the neighbors. We're ready to go. Now starting these engines requires that you follow a very specific start sequence. Turn on the fan, turn on the spark, and then turn on the fuel. You don't want to run the fuel into an engine without an ignition source because you can flood the engine with fuel. Typically they start best when you run them at about 50% throttle for the startup. So that's where we've got it set. We're going to get going. Got your headphones? Yep. All right. <laughs> These are very, very loud. Okay, so camera's set up and everything. Looks good. Okay, we're Ready? all set, I guess. Yeah, I'll stand behind you. <laughs> all right, here we go. Fan on. Spark on. <laughs> Wild. Now I'm going to leave the fan on for about 30 seconds to a minute to cool things down because if we let it cook with all the heat from the engine, it can actually damage the valve. So it's not a bad idea to keep the blower on for a short period of time. <laughs> this thing is amazing, you know? I, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> now, what we're going to do is I'm going to compare this to the results if we leave the fan running the entire time. We'll see if we get an increase in the thrust. So, are you ready? Sure. All right. Yeah, why not? Yeah, let's do it again. All right. Now, fan on. <laughs> Spark on. Fuel at 50%. Three, two, one.
fuel. That's what low compression ratio does for you. How was that? <laughs> <laughs> Loud. And so far, no police. Well, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, originally, I was going to attach the augmenter to see what we can do to the thrust levels. But this was intimidating. The entire table was shaking. And reportedly, these augmenters can more than double the power output of these pulsed engines. And I'm not really convinced that we have a setup here that's safe enough to be able to do that. So I think we're going to stop here and I'm going to have to try to figure out a way to better stabilize this table in order to make this a safe test. And so what we're gonna do is we'll troubleshoot that, I'll come up with a good method, and then we're gonna post another video very, very soon uh, where we test the augmenter and compare the results. But I think that way, not only do we have fun, but we stay safe. And so I really appreciate your watching and appreciate it if you subscribe, if you wanna keep an eye on the channel because we'll try to put up that next video as soon as possible. So thanks a lot, take care, have fun.